All right. So this is the second of our six weeks of uh, reviewing a push. I uh, hope all of you have been well. Uh, the first class is indeed on YouTube if you weren't here or if there's anything you wanted to go back over. And of course, you're always welcome to shoot me an email outside of class time as well. Uh, send, you know, just email ian at prepmatters.com and I'll get back to you as soon as I'm able to. All right, so you'll remember last week we talked a little bit about, we talked about periods one and two and we talked about the major course themes. Uh, the, the overviews of those are on the course website and once more, um, the brand new set of study terms that can be used for a push and can be used for the US history subject test uh, are all on the Prep Matters uh, webpage for this particular class. Uh, and there's also a DBQ on that page. Uh, if you haven't, or you, the link to the DBQ went out in the reminder for this uh, class this morning or early this afternoon. Uh, but if you haven't had a chance to look at it, we'll take a look at it in a moment as well going to look at a DBQ from just a couple years ago, 2017, that takes up the evolving ideas about American independence between 1763, that is the end of the Seven Years' War, and 1783, when the Revolutionary War ends and the British recognize American independence. And so I'll give you a moment uh, in a minute or two to look over that DBQ. And then we're going to come back to it at the end of today's class after we reviewed, have reviewed the content for today uh, about period three, and we've talked about some of the major themes of this era. And, you know, we'll talk about some of the themes you might imagine, especially politics and power, you know, with the separation from the of the colonies from Britain, and they're coming together in revolution, first under the Articles of Confederation, and then under the constitutional system we've had pretty much, you know, with some modifications since 1789. We'll be alluding here and there to the role of the United States in the broader world, a nation that was forged in what has been called at times uh, the world's first world war uh, through its war from independence and the quasi-isolationism that comes out of the 1790s. I'll talk a bit here and there about social structures, particularly about race and gender during this period, as Americans are drawn increasingly together by an ideology of freedom. Uh, but we do need, as we talk about ideas about freedom and liberty, to understand, to pay attention to who gets to enjoy the fruits of that liberty and who doesn't. Those and the other major course themes of APUSH, you know, will all be interconnected with the course theme that I'm gonna really emphasize today. The theme that the, the DBQ asks about, uh, the making of a common American national identity. So I look at uh, this period in terms of about five, four or five major categories, depending on how we count. Um, the French and Indian Wars or the Seven Years' War, their, their interrelated conflicts that take us from 15, uh, 1754 to 1763. Uh, basically, the beginning of, you know, the idea of some kind of united America. We'll look at the Revolutionary Era, roughly that goes from the end of the French and Indian Wars in 1763 to the victory in the American Revolution uh, as of 1783. Um, and as we have time, I'll talk about uh, the Articles of Confederation and the new Constitution Bill of Rights. The first step with the Articles of creating a new system, a new American government that, as it turned out, quickly failed, followed by the Constitution with which we're much more familiar. And finally, if we get to it, uh, I'll talk about the first Federalist era, the presidencies of George Washington and John Adams that take us to 1800 and set the uh, precedence for what comes over the last two centuries and change. Uh, if we don't end up having time for that, I'll happily take questions. And the term list will still give you some uh, good ways to think about how to study for that, not just in terms of absorbing material, but how to thematically connect it to what comes before or after. So we'll just spend about uh, a few minutes looking at the DBQ just for this purpose is to read through the documents to think about, okay, how do you read through these documents with an eye towards uh, the question about making of a common American identity, what changes? We'll, we'll take a look at that in a second, since you're going to have to do something very similar uh, on the official test, either if you take it on May 15th or on June 3rd uh, with a modified DBQ. So if you don't already have it, the DBQ is uh, as I said, on the website, uh, 
um, and actually I've got the documents at the end of this uh, PowerPoint, but I'll save that for the uh, end of class. But let, if you can just sort of tell me for the Q and A, how, uh, if you have a chance to look at those, um, the link is in the email you got for this class. And I, you know, as you chime in, uh, I will note the kind of sources, some of which are sort of the most traditional kinds of sources you can imagine for a question like this. Samuel Addison, Samuel Adams' uh, piece on the rights of colonists, Tom and Thomas Paine's legendary piece, The American Crisis. Um, lesser known figures writing about for or against the revolution uh, in their letters, in their journals, um, speaking to assemblies. Uh, and even you know, we have a photograph of a teapot that illustrates some of the ideas about Indo American identity and independence that are coming out of this period. Um, but I want to give you about another minute or so to just look through what uh, the document and sort of just think about these core questions about sort of where do you see you know, notions of this contested you know, ideas about American independence and about even what connects Americans as Americans. I want to really just talk about American national identity and thinking about, okay, you know, here we are. You know, we're viewing for a push. We're studying American history. You know, whether your ancestors have been in the United States for many generations or whether you yourself were born somewhere else, you basically take for granted, understandably, that there is an America to study. The United States, a reasonably coherent, if diverse, if always evolving, American culture, American history, a nation, a sense of being American that whatever your politics, whatever your relationship to being American is, it's there. But of course, you know, it wasn't always here in the sense of something that we would think of as American. Uh, America had to be made, it had to be fashioned, it had to come into existence. And today we're talking about the period of birth of some coherent notion of America not only of the revolution, of the Declaration of Independence, the war for independence, and ultimately the Constitution, the Washington as first president, but the idea that there is something inherently uniting the original colonies, that there is something American, uh, and that, it, that grows into the 50 states and territories uh, today. And indeed, that gets at the question in the DBQ, how do Ameri ideas about American independence change over this key 20-year period? So you may remember what I said last week in terms of how the experience of slavery forged the notion of coherent Black America, that there is something connecting people of African descent of many different languages, of many different faith systems from different places, you know, that it is the experience of, of slavery, of uh, sometimes forced conversion to Christianity, of being here that creates a common Black identity. You know, similarly, you know, the idea that there is some coherent idea about some coherent thing calling, you know, making people American Indians, Native Americans, you know, is very much the product of the arrival of Europeans and other peoples here. That, you know, beforehand, you know, when the Aztecs and Incas are conquering their neighbors, when you have the Wampanoag, when you have the Pequot and the Lenape, you have the Creek and Cherokee and Seminole all living side by side, sharing some languages or related languages, trading with each other, sometimes fighting with each other, grouped by language, grouped by region, but there's certainly nothing that you, no one is thinking of themselves as Native American until there's a European arrival to think about. Um, and remember what I said last week as well about in the context of Europeans enslaving both Africans and indigenous Americans, uh, dividing the world, not in terms of race as we think of it now, but in terms between Christian and quote unquote heathen, between quote unquote civilized and barbarian. Um, Europeans themselves organized them, uh, themselves around some mix of geography, language, uh, and faith systems. And like their neighbor, people all around the world were battling with each other. So it's not entirely clear why all the colonists would actually come together and unite. After all, we talked about how the colonies were founded for so many different reasons. Massachusetts, Connecticut as religious colonies, and Rhode Island as a colony for tolerance for people escaping from Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Maryland was a Quaker colony, excuse me, Maryland was a Catholic colony, Pennsylvania was a Quaker colony. New Amsterdam, later New York, is set up as a trading outpost for the Dutch 
uh, who are involved in the fur trade up the Hudson River. And then the Southern colonies, starting with Virginia and later the Carolinas, are primarily all economic enterprises. This is not a recipe for a united society. So to set the stage for the emergence of you know, America, I want to talk briefly about something that historians have come to call the middle ground. Uh, it's a description of the territory, especially on you know, you know, the broader Ohio Valley territory, uh, west of the Appalachians, and how over the last late 17th century and early 18th century, um, that Western territory became a flash ground, flash point for the English, the French, and various Native American peoples, a place where they can negotiate. Um, if you looked at last week's terms list, you saw a couple conflicts between Eastern colonies and, uh, excuse me, between Western colonists, English colonists uh, on the Western frontier and Native Americans, basically along the line where we go from green to purple on this map. Uh, you saw Bacon's Rebellion, you saw King Philip's War, uh, King, excuse me, you saw King Philip's War in Massachusetts, you saw Bacon's Rebellion in Virginia. Uh, Native Americans who had been uh, living along the coast had been steadily pushed inland, a process made easier by uh, depopulation as Native Americans succumbed to diseases that Eng the English brought over. The middle ground emerges in the Ohio Valley, where the British and French land claims came together. Uh, and where all sorts of Native American peoples lived, either peoples who had originally been there, or who had been pushed out from the North and from the South. And the various Native peoples, whether we're talking about the Iroquois from the North, whether we're talking about the Cherokees and the Chickasaws from the South, all learned that building permanent alliances with the English or the French wasn't particularly productive. Uh, but they did manage to sort of play the imperial rivalry off. Uh, they learned to get the French and the British to sort of effectively, you know, battle with each other and sort of try to take advantage of being in the middle. And for a while, for decades, this worked through the first half of the 1700s. It didn't give them anything remotely like equality, but it did allow the various Native American peoples some level of autonomy. But over the first half of the 1700s, especially as we get towards 1750 or so, English settlers, Scotch-Irish settlers, German settlers, keep pouring into the Ohio Valley. And again, I'm talking about what's now the state of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Illinois. Um, there's very fertile agricultural land. And by this point, the British Empire has grown to be a global empire. And when a backcountry revolt, excuse me, a backcountry conflict erupts in 1754 in the Ohio Valley, between the English on the one hand and the French and Native Americans on the other, it launches what was called by some the world's first world war. This conflict ends up being fought not only in the Ohio River Valley, but in the Caribbean, in West Africa, in India, in the Philippines, and on the mainland of Europe. Um, it pits, pits the British and the American colonists on one side along with Prussia, along with the Iroquois, and other allies. The other side is the French, other Native American peoples, especially those in what's now Canada, um, Russia, Spain, and yet other allies as well. I'm not going to go into all the gory details of the war that tends not to come up on a push, um, but this war not only transforms the balance of power in Europe, a topic for European and world history courses, but it does radically change the face of North America. In the end, the British and their allies triumph. The French leave the North American mainland. They trade Louisiana to Spain. They trade uh, the, their Canadian territories for sugar islands in the Caribbean. Spain gives up Florida to the British. Um, and we're gonna come back to some of these territories later on, but for, the immediate, for our immediate purposes, the British now rule all of Eastern North America, everything east of the Mississippi River. And with the French gone, so too is gone the middle ground. Native Americans no longer have the French and the English to play off against each other. And warfare between the colonists and uh, Native American peoples intensifies quickly. Colonies like Pennsylvania, uh, founded originally by William and Penn, with a promise, quote, in his words, of true friendship and amity between colonists and Native peoples, um, become the site of some of the bloodiest 
battles of the 1760s. And all of this comes despite the proclamation line of 1763, that red squiggly line on this map, uh, that in theory prohibited further settlement of that, uh, by white settlers west of that line, uh, reserving the inland territories for Native Americans. As it turned out, settlers tended to ignore that, and the imposition of this line became one of the early grievances of the colonists against the British Crown. The Seven Years' War was transformative in encouraging Americans to think of themselves as American, as united against the French and against Native Americans. For the moment, grievances like the, pro the proclamation line notwithstanding, uh, the colonists generally considered themselves as of the end of the war, uh, proud members of the British Empire, the Protestant British Empire. The fact that they triumph over France, over Catholic France and its so-called popish slavery, uh, you know, was a point of pride. And for many American colonists, the, the connections between British national identity, Protestantism, and liberty were reinforced by the victory in the Seven Years' War. But there were signs of a new American identity through the war. There is the Albany Plan of 1754 in which Benjamin Franklin calls for what makes what's really the first call for a united colonial government government with the power to levy taxes, to provide for the common defense, and to manage relations with Native Americans. His newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, you, know, you may well have seen this image that has sort of survived in many forms, reappears and repur is repurposed to this day with the message of join or die that all of the colonies, not all of them are on this snake, but that divided, you die, united, you come together in, uh, and will thrive and will, uh, victory will win. The Albany Plan doesn't go anywhere, but at least sets in motion the thinking about the idea of a united colonial government. And over time, over the course of the 1760s and early 1770s, more and more American colonials come to think that being subjects of the British crown, rather than protecting their liberty, would endanger it. All of this changes over, yeah, there's no, it's a 1763, nobody imagines that, you know, 12 years later, you, you would be embarking on the first shots of what becomes the American War for Independence uh, at the Battle of Lexington and Concord, right outside of Boston. The fast takeaway of this period is that the British went into incredible debt to pay for the Seven Years' War, and they tried to get a lot of that money back on the, uh, through a range of taxes and tariffs on their American colonies, infuriating the colonists so much that they rebelled in the name of liberty. There's plenty of accuracy if, you know, as two, three sentence summaries of the causes of revolution go, it's a decent one. Um, and there's, it does prompt the, some of the debating views of what the revolution meant. You know, is it a radical break with the past? Is it a victory for the enlightenment of the rational rule of men? And of course, at this time, as I'll be talking about later, you know, the notion of it being of men was taken for granted. You know, it's a, is it primarily a break with the divine right of kings, you know, instituting instead a Republican system of government dedicated to the protection of liberty? Or, you know, is it in the eyes of others, a conservative uprising to protect the economic interests and property of the colonial elite and the emerging middle class? who claim liberty for some, but certainly not for all. Now, both of these arguments, the radical take on the revolution, the conservative take on the revolution, um, there's evidence for both. Uh, I'm not particularly invested in the time we have about sort of saying it's one or the other, but I do think that, you know, APUSH tends to like asking you to sort of take a stand and sort of say, here's the evidence for one position or another, or connecting it to questions about a common identity. Um, and I certainly will come back to questions about who gets included in that liberty and who doesn't. Now, if you, anytime you've studied this period, you remember that this, you know, this new slide is just some of the many acts, some of the most famous acts between 1763 and 1774 that so infuriate the American colonials that they revolt. Uh, I'm not gonna go through them individually. They're in your textbooks if you have a textbook. They're easy to look up. Uh, but they are all part of the story that leads to revolution. And you remember that the key uh, economic principle of British rule in North America was mercantilism. Uh, 
it's really the point of colonialism, to enrich the mother country. Uh, the British passed all sorts of laws in the late 1600s and early 1700s, curtailing the economic activity of the colonists, but by and large, they left those laws unenforced. And you may have heard about the term for this, salutary neglect. So on paper, you have all these regulations limiting what colonists are supposed to do. In practice, the British tended to leave the American colonists alone before the Seven Years' War. During the war, the British tended to treat the American colonists as partners and as allies. But after the war ends, they return to treating the colonists as subjects of the British Empire. Uh, for that is the free white settlers of the American colonies, you know, those people tended to think of themselves as having the same rights as British, as Britons back in the United Kingdom. And this attitude is similar, you know, in the British colonies in Canada, in India, in the West Indies and elsewhere. To say the least, the British did not see it this way. Now, from the British point of view, they'd come out of the war, you know, more than 150 million pounds in debt. Now, in today's currency, that's trillions of dollars. So Britain was pretty desperate to sort of rebuild its economy and to sort of pay off all the debts. And they took the position that, hey, we took, you know, we borrowed all this money to defend the colonies. Perhaps it's a good time for the colonists to chip in and you know, pay, help pay that off. Um, also, let's maybe start paying attention to some of those laws that have been on the books forever. Um, now that Britain really needs the revenue. As you might imagine, this doesn't go over terribly well in the colonies. Exacerbating the anger of American colonists is the principle of virtual representation. The idea that the British Parliament represented all the subjects of the empire, even those who had no representatives in uh, Parliament directly. For Americans, they were subject, this, their perspective was, that they were now subject to all sorts of new tax laws without anyone speaking for them in parliament. That is that they faced taxation without representation, a phrase that again, you know, we know well today, and maybe even on some of your license plates. Um, and it becomes a rallying cry in the colonies. So the list of grievances against the British crown is mounting. There's the proclamation line of 1763, and now we have a whole series of new taxes. Again, I'm not going to go through all of the, uh, everything on this list, but there is a cycle here. London would pass a new uh, tax or tariff on the colonists, you know, on sugar, on tea, on other economic activity. They would re meet with resistance from the colonials. They would back down, and yet they would pass another, even harsher round of legislation, even stricter tariffs and taxes, further annoying the American colonists. An interesting side effect of all of this is that by passing law after law that apply to all of the colonies as a whole, rather than just Massachusetts, just Virginia, just New York, et cetera, um, they further united the colonies in resistance and anger against the British crown. And this really helped foster that sense of being American through the process of taxation, that being taxed by the British gave, yeah, Basically, think of it this way. I mean, you know, think about any time you might not have something in common with the rest of your classmates, but you're all really annoyed with your teacher. That gives you something in common. It does actually help build a, system, you know, a sense of solidarity. This is a much bigger principle. This is a much bigger scale, but it's that same kind of principle that the passage of all these laws um, might, did in fact end up help build a common shared identity among the free people of the American colonies. Increasingly, and you notice my language here about free and white, increasingly free white colonials used a language invoking the metaphor of slavery to describe what they experienced at the hands of, of the British versus the liberty that they were entitled to as subjects of the British crown. Now, the discrepancy here between this and actual slavery is something that at least some observers at that time were aware of, and certainly we were, are very aware of in retrospect. Um, as you will probably remember, there's a whole series of boycotts of British goods. American ec economic activity grows from the self-sufficiency. There's the Boston Massacre. There's the Boston Tea Party. Um, this is an engraving of the Boston Massacre by Paul Revere. Um, this, in fact, is 
a wonderful example of propaganda since the, the violence in Boston was really an unruly, basically a bar fight, not much more than a bar fight. I mean, it was lethal, um, but it wasn't British military forces firing on an unarmed peaceful crowd. Um, but images like this go a long way to helping stir up resentment against the British. And through this period, you know, it, the sense that a conflict is looming is pretty clear. Uh, as British authority was challenged more and more, as calls from liberty from Britain grow ever louder. Uh, and as the British sort of moral authority over their colonies weakens, um, just anger increases. You have the first Continental Congress in September and October of 1774, which urged Americans to defy British laws, urged Americans to withhold taxes and to prepare for war. At this point, still two years before the Declaration of Independence, the justification is in terms of the rights, their rights as Englishmen, of the liberties that they are entitled to as subjects of the British crown, as natural born citizens of the empire. But language is beginning to shift and ideas are beginning to shift. And there's a movement towards the ideas of the enlightenment from the rights of, you know, that come under the king to that of you know, the natural inherent rights of people. Again, in this period, specifically of men. Um, by 1775 in May, you have the beginning of the second constitute, excuse me, Continental Congress, which it becomes the de facto provisional government of the colonies during the war. Uh, it's launched again in May 1775, a month after the first battle at Lexington and Concord, Massachusetts. The second constitutional, uh, the second Continental Congress uh, authorized the creation of an army to fight for independence, uh, to print money to pay for that army, and appointed George Washington as commander of the new military. The war escalates, and on July 2nd, 1776, the uh, Continental Congress declares the United States to be an independent nation. Two days later, the day we celebrate, the Congress ratifies the Declaration of Independence authored by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson's words represent a forceful fundamental break, not only from Britain itself, but to the inherent nature of liberty as it had been understood and as it's moving forward. The preamble, which is here on the PowerPoint, uh, you are probably familiar with. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is a justification for rebellion, that the and the list of grievances in the rest of the Declaration is about how George III denied all of these rights, got in the way of all these rights. So it's a justification for rebellion. And sure, it's, it's, it's absolutely essential to point out the limitations, both understood at the time and as we have 250 years of hindsight. One of Jefferson's early drafts had a clause condemning the slave trade and King George III's attempts to interfere with laws that would have ended the slave trade, or at least limited it. He had to drop that at the insistence of South Carolinian and Georgian delegates to the Constitutional Con the uh, Continental Congress. And yes, Thomas Jefferson himself, the author of the Declaration of Independence, owned how many slaves? So there are contradictions upon contradictions upon contradictions here. At the same time, these, their, the elasticity of these words was evident. If life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness were inalienable to all, how long could they be denied to some? And so we really get at you know, the expanding notion of American exceptionalism, the idea that of a national identity that's more, that has ethnic and racial implications, that has religious implications, but in many ways is an ideology as much as it is uh, a matter of geography, of social structure, of faith, and other forces shaping this country. 
you know, this is tremendously different from the, the, the example of American exceptionalism we talked about last week with John Winthrop sitting on a hill speech. Uh, but there is the idea that the United States remains a moral beacon to the world that is a symbol of freedom and a refuge from tyranny. Um, Jefferson writes is not addressing the king directly or just colonists directly, but to the opinions of all mankind in his word. Uh, James Madison calls the new nation, the United States, the workshop of liberty. That is, he calls it the workshop of liberty to the civil, civilized world. And we'll keep paying attention to all these qualifiers. I'm not going to march you through all of the uh, battles of the uh, Revolutionary War. You know, to the victory at Yorktown in 1781, to the Treaty of Paris in 1783, that by which the British recognize uh, the independence of the United States. As you've probably gathered, the AP exams are generally more interested in the road to conflict and the outcomes of conflict and of revolution than on specific battles and tactics. So I'll note instead a few key things about questions of liberty, especially as they connect to questions about American national identity, about the political st structures that emerge from the revolution, uh, the political structures, the political system that emerges as well. Uh, you may have heard of uh, Abigail Adams' letter to her husband, John Adams, in March 1776. Uh, this is an, something that's come up on both APUSH exams and AP uh, Lang exams as a rhetoric assignment, um, the so-called Remember the Ladies letter. Abigail writes to her husband, John, to remember the ladies when you're debating at the Continental Congress, to remember the rights of women and not just only think in terms of men. Now, Abigail Adams is not calling for absolute equality between men and women, but she does offer him a reminder to rein in the absolute power that husbands had over their wives, legally as well as socially. We tend to remember her powerful letter, the Remember the Letters, Remember the Ladies letter. At the same time, we don't spend as much time looking at John Adams's response, which pretty much took her letter as a joke. I cannot but laugh, he wrote. We know better to re than to repeal our masculine systems. He goes on to talk about how we have been told that our struggle for independence for freedom has loosened the bands of government everywhere. He goes on to cite children being disobedient, Native Am students rising in protest, school uh, Native Americans protesting against settlers, African-American slaves protesting against their owners. But your letter was the first intimation that another tribe more numer numerous and powerful than all the rest were grown discontented. So we have here John Adams completely rejecting the notion of, you know, that all these other groups are entitled to invoke their inalienable rights. John Adams would makes a good case for the conservative interpretation of the uh, revolution, while others like Patrick Henry would represent a more radical take on the revolution. But here we have Adams completely skeptical of, you know, that the revolution has anything to say to women or to African Americans or to Native Americans, uh, and. This does raise an important question when we think about the language of the Declaration and of this Enlightenment. If you use the natural order to justify the expansion of rights, what happens when you deny the rights of those deemed, for whatever reason, to be naturally inferior? inferior? Uh, and that's going to be something we come back to again and again as we look through the review course. By and large, even free white women uh, gained few rights during the revolution. Though you will see references here and there to Republican motherhood, a notion that becomes more and more uh, widespread during the revolutionary era. And it speaks to the belief that women, again, and here we're talking about free white women, had a particular indispensable role in the revolution, in the new nation, training future citizens. As you might imagine, for Native Americans, the outcome of the revolution was not particularly positive. Um, the British abandoned their allies at the Treaty of Paris. Some Native American, those Native Americans who sided with the colonists fared no better 
there's no longer anything uh, holding back settlement of the lands between the Mississippi River and the Appalachian Mountains. And indeed, many of the early revolutionary leaders uh, and government leaders were major, were very much involved with speculation with the territory in that region. Even Thomas Jefferson began to talk that the conflicts between white Americans and Native Americans would not cease until the latter were, were removed to west of the Mississippi River. Native Americans turned to the language of the revolution, of the Iroquois in the North, the, uh, the Creeks, the Choctaws begin to talk about in their independence, their natural rights, of the infringement upon their freedom. They used the language of the American Revolution, but this offered them, they made little headway in finding a new place in the new country. Now, for African Americans, the story is more complex. Overall, the revolution's leaders included many slaveholders and some patriots, patriots as well as some British, noted the hypocrisy of calling for the liberty of white Americans while enslaving those of African descent. The war allowed thousands of slaves to escape their owners, and between 1774, excuse me, 1777 and 1804, every state north of Maryland took a move towards abolition and emancipation. Uh, not necessarily all slaves were freed, but all uh, African Americans born into slavery, born to slave parents, excuse me, were considered free people. And we do see the birth of large African American communities in the North, especially in Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. To give you a numerical sense of this, uh, in 1776, there were fewer than 10,000 uh, free African Americans in the, in the colonies. By 1810, there's 200,000 free African Americans. You have new institutions, you have new schools, you have new black churches, and this becomes the bedrock of anti-slavery politics specifically and black political action more broadly moving forward. And we'll come back to that next week when we look at a DBQ about the anti-slavery movement. Um, at the same time, slavery itself is also growing in the South. And in 1790, there are 200,000 more slaves in the South, in the United States, uh, than there had been you know, just 14 years before when the Declaration of Independence uh, was ratified. All right, uh, what I think I'm gonna do, sort of keeping an eye on time, is I wanna spend, I'll spend about 10 minutes on the uh, Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, key things that you wanna pay attention to, and the 1790s, but I wanna then sort of spend the rest of our time, uh, 10 minutes or so, on the documents. Um, you now and then we'll see questions about the Articles of Confederation. And if, by the way, if you take the subject test, you can pretty much count on seeing this. Uh, and in fact, the material between 1783 and 1800, the subject test in this particular loves to test. A push, um, it's hard to tell when they'll pick to cover you uh, chronologically, given the shortened time period of this course, um, but certainly is gonna be in the running. You will you'll probably study the Articles of Confederation, at least in passing, uh, the first system of government set up for the newly independent United States. Uh, and it was a reaction to the, you know, George III and to the fear of tyranny. And so it was a very loose pact uniting the states. Um, I had a question about subject tests being canceled. I would say extremely unlikely. Those tests have been written. Um, when specifically they're going to be offered, we don't have a definitive answer for that, but it's, there will be subject tests at some point. Um, and more broadly, the SAT is talking about uh, setting up replacement dates for all of its tests that get canceled so that they'll have more opportunities to take both the SAT and the subject test. So if they cancel, let's just say they, they already canceled for many people March, um, May, and we don't know about June, but we have our suspicions, you know, they may well be adding three other dates later on. So those tests will be available even if not necessarily right away. I'll leave this here with the, might as well leave this here with the prompt. Um, but the Articles of Confederation are, you know, a reaction to the fear of tyranny. And so they are, in the words of the document itself, a firm league of 
friendship uniting the states that retain their sovereignty, their freedom, their independence, which means, as you probably remember, the Articles of Confederation can't get much done. They can't, they have no power to raise revenue. They have no ability to, they offer the new government no ability to raise an army, uh, to regulate commerce. It takes nine out of the 13 new states to approve any piece of legislation. It takes a unanimous agreement of all 13 states to change the articles. Um, it's very clear right away that the Articles of Confederation doesn't, can't get much done. It has one signature success, the Northwest Ordinance, which sets up a plan for organizing the territories of the Ohio Valley eventually into the five states of Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, uh, Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, and, and sort of for them to be admitted as new equal states. But beyond that, um, it really can't get much done. And when a rebellion erupts in Western Massachusetts, the Shays Rebellion, uh, and the federal government is unable to respond, it's left to local leaders to put it down. And this really alarms many of the leaders of the revolution and of the new government that they need a fundamental fix. And that just sort of reforming the Articles of Confederation uh, won't be enough. This leads to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, this leads to the drafting of a the system of government that uh, we still have today uh, with modification. Um, this involves the separation of powers into the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Uh, this includes uh, the balance of power between the federal government and the state. Both of those themes come up all the time in this course as well as in AP NSL. Um, you can imagine how many different questions get at the tension between state power and federal power, since that remains to this day in 2020, one of the very most heated political divides in this country. And when does one take precedence over the other? Uh, you have likely referred to the Federalist Papers, the set of essays uh, written by James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay that argued for the passage of the new constitution, for the ratification of the new constitution. Uh, Madison in particular was concerned about factionalism, as you'll recall, and about sort of finding a balance between the, the threat of tyranny and the need to get stuff done. Alexander Hamilton uh, was primarily concerned with the creation of a strong federal government, and that guides his influence through uh, the, all the way through his role as Secretary of Treasure, of the Treasury during the Washington administration. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the details, certainly not going to go into all the details of the Constitution, but being aware of the Great Compromise, uh, which sets up the, two, the bicameral Congress we have, the Senate uh, and the House of Representatives. The Senate as the representatives of the states, the representatives, House of Representatives as, of course, representatives of the people. Um, and that is a compromise that's set up between the big states that want to sort of assert their power and the small states that are afraid of being uh, drowned out by the larger states. You also will want to pay attention to the three-fifths compromise, which is the regrettable compromise that uh, accounted for how do you count the population of states with large slave populations. And in the end, that it said that African-American slaves would be counted as three-fifths of uh, the population of freed persons when coming up with a census and when, when conducting the census and when coming up with congressional representation uh, plans. You will certainly want to know about the Bill of Rights, um, particularly how the Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution uh, where the first 10 amendments and were written you know, with an eye towards uh, satisfying the grave concerns of many anti-federalist uh, politicians and anti-federalist people more broadly, uh, and that sort of protecting the rights of speech, of religion, of assembly, uh, of freedom from unreasonable search and seizure, uh, and the rights of states to pass laws uh, that are not mentioned in the Constitution for the federal government to be under their purview. Um, all right, I think in terms of time, I want to turn to the DBQ. 
uh, I'll take questions by email about the 1790s, but really knowing the difference between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, knowing the difference between what Thomas Jefferson supported and what Alexander Hamilton supported, those are really the key things, along with Washington's farewell address, where he uh, advised the country against getting involved with um, permanent alliances. And that remains the US policy from Washington forward into the beginning of the 20th century. And there's only a fundamental break with Washington's advice about permanent alliances with World War II and with the creation of NATO at the end of the war. Um, that comes up in all sorts of ways, even though this course, this test won't go to uh, past 1900, you should, uh, past 1945, you should definitely be aware of that since that happens right at the end of this material. All right. Does everybody have access to the DBQ through the website uh, and through, uh, and again, I can go back to the question, um, but I can also scroll through the documents here. The question is about how do notions of American independence change between 1763 and 1783? With the DBQ, you're going to have to sort of look at the documents, use the knowledge you've studied, uh, and from both your knowledge and from the documents, build an argument that shows your understanding, your ability to create an argument, your understanding of primary sources as well as of the period and of the major themes. So here we have a teapot. Um, no Stamp Act, America, Liberty Restored. Probably weren't expecting to write in a DBQ about uh, a teapot. If this was 2017, you would be. Um, and it's possible you'll see some other item of material culture um, of, you know, basically objects that have historical significance that sort of reflect not just that they're important because they're uh, associated with famous people, but because they reflect important ideas, important developments in time. If you have these documents by all means be reading them as well on your whatever device you're on uh, shouldn't be too hard to do that probably be easier to do that uh, from whatever you've got handy uh, than the powerpoint but i have it here in case anyone who doesn't have access this is a document from the virginia house of burgesses uh, the first legislative body repre uh, representative body in the colonies and it is expressing the, uh, the viewpoint of the uh, representatives to another set of taxes imposed from London from, by the king and his representatives. Give you a moment to read that. You certainly can see here that at this point, the while this is expressing frustration and anger uh, in the formal language of the 1760s, it's still not by any means rebellious against uh, the crown and the king. Document three from Samuel Adams, uh, more of a rabble rouser than his brother John. And here we have in 1772, one of the early expressions of the Enlightenment language, the language of men having a right to remain in the state of nature, of their rights, um, the natural liberty of man. It's not to be under the will or legislative authority of man, but only to have the law of nature for his rule. So certainly this is something that you could connect to um, you know, changing ideas about liberty, changing ideas about independence. And this is you know, more than just listing grievances against the king. This Quaker address to the Pennsylvania uh, Colonial Assembly, commenting on the you know, rise, the uprising, uh, not particularly excited about the protests, as you can see, calling for you know continued loyalty to the king and his government, looking for restoration of order, 
and being just generally not uh, in favor of the you know, growing unrest among Pennsylvanians and the rest of the colonies. Here we have a diary entry from a woman from Scotland visiting her brother in North Carolina. Um, by this point, there is open rebellion at 17, June 1775. Uh, this is after the Battle of Lexington and uh, Concord. Uh, by this point, North Carolina and some of the colonies are under martial law. Uh, certainly the fear of violence of like who, sort of the fear among uh, basically getting at the fear of the loyalists, the people who remained loyal to the crown of what they could be, what danger they faced if they refused to join with the rebels. We have here a document from an Anglican minister in New York City, uh, as you know, sort of contemplating the financial costs of the rebellion. So certainly this is a piece where you might be thinking about, okay, why is a minister you know, writing about the financial costs of rebellion? It is interesting that he brings up the fear of further taxation as a reason not to, you know, sort of to be wary, uh, wary of rebellion. And the last document is the famous piece, for, an excerpt from Thomas Paine's famous, The American Crisis. These are the times that try men's souls. You may have heard this phrase. Certainly the references to uh, the summer soldier, uh, the sunshine patriot, those who, you know, when times get tough, will uh, sort of back away and leave the fight, leave the uh, battle. And so this is, again, sort of much more um, flowery, intense language uh, calling for uh, resistance, calling for determination in the wake of you know, tough conditions. And indeed, you know, his time, his references to the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot, keep an eye on the fact that this is written in late December. You know, this is almost certainly a piece that evokes that things have got much tougher and that the road to independence will not be easy. Uh, if you have a minute or two to hang around for use the Q&A to throw out how you might um, use these, uh, I'll be happy to stay on for a few more minutes and talk about how you could you know, weave these together into an essay. Uh, but I want you to think about them as pieces for an essay of your own about what changes, what doesn't, what connects folks who are increasingly supportive of revolution and of independence from those who don't. Um, so I'll stick around um, if you need to go. Um, I will see you next week and we'll be talking about the early Republic period four. Um, but yeah, stick around for another five minutes if you wanna chat about how you would use these and get my feedback. And otherwise, again, you can always email me at ian at prepmatters.com. So if you've got questions, so it's now uh, about six minutes after, I will stay, give it five minutes. Um, yeah, take a moment to read through the documents through the website document and I can scroll back to any of these if you need me to. Um, let me know what you think. Let me know what questions you have about uh, the, you know, how you could use these. So we've got one comment. You could use the teapot to show that there's an increasing solidarity in American identity that is brewing. Love the use of brewing, nice job, uh, as a result of the British taxation of the colonies. Well done. And of course, connecting this to the Tea Act, to the Tea Party, seems awfully tempting, doesn't it? I will see if I can get the DBQ for next week sent out much earlier so that you can really have time to dig into it over the week, uh, if that'd be helpful. Question, how would you tie in the document written by the priest? Now keep in mind, you'll get five documents, not seven, and you'll have to use at least four, but let's uh, look at that one. Where is the money to come from which will defray this enormous annual expense of three million sterling? And all these other debts, I, just, I know not. I would probably do it in terms of thinking about 
what are the practical challenges of independence? Um, how is a new country going to get its economy off the ground? Uh, there are very legitimate concerns about how will a new nation be able to afford pretty much anything, especially given the debts. And certainly when you're studying the Artemis Confederation and then Alexander Hamilton, managing the debts that the American colonists accumulated in the new American states accumulated during the revolution uh, is a major economic concern. And it is Alexander Hamilton who, for better and for worse, his plan does help get the United States back to a financial solvency and to having adequate credit. Um, so thinking about how the very practical questions of independence, it's all wonderful to talk about liberty and freedom. What does that look like when you still have to pay the bills when you need to be able to feed the people? So I think that comes to mind as one way to use it and sort of how, how practical is this? Thank you all for coming. Appreciate the questions, appreciate you showing up. I'm looking forward to talking about period four next week. Again, don't hesitate to email me if you have questions and look forward to uh, talking with you all shortly. Take care now.